27th of this year, we ran the headline out of federal documents that were made public in federal court that listeners pointed out to us. We ran the news story, top Mexican drug lord, I traffic cocaine for the U.S. government, written by Paul Joseph Watson for Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. Now, when I got off the air yesterday, Aaron ran over, Aaron Dykes, and he said, you haven't seen this? And I said, no. He goes, well, it's been on InfoWars all day, our link to it. And so I read the report, did some more research, and I said, I think we reported on this. And I went and looked it up, and we sure did. The part that the um, El Paso Times does not cover is that uh, he and others he's associated with in this cartel have said they also were involved in getting guns and were involved in Fast and Furious, and this nexus is it in. Now, uh, the Associated Press, Florida Papers, of course, broke it, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, uh, have all reported that Fast and Furious, ATF, E, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives, they're always adding new things onto their name, uh, and the FBI and DEA have been involved shipping thousands of guns, not just to Mexico, but to Miami and other areas, to select gangs that are waging covert wars against drug cartels that are not paying their cut. And I talked about, of course, um, the Reuters report back in 1999 when Richard Grasso, then head of the New York Stock Exchange, traveled. And it mentioned, well, there's a little known federal law that actually drug money from overseas can be invested uh, in U.S. banks and the stock market. And he was there encouraging, and it showed them meeting, the head of the FARC. You can dig up the photo, the head of the FARC gorillas down in Columbia, big, big beard. I forget his name, you can look it up. And he said, invest with us or you're going to be invaded. They gave him a year, he didn't invest, uh, they ended up killing him. And the, of course, the U.S. military uh, invaded down there, called it drug interdiction. And it's admitted that they have grids they fly where uh, the government-grown cocaine that's laundered through the U.S. is left alone. And then they find FARC fields of coca and, and those are sprayed. So it's, it's a business operation. And the list goes on and on. Vietnam and the coffins full of heroin. Confirmed congressional hearings. The 1980s, Iran-Contra shipping guns down there to knock out the drug competition, ship the cocaine back. The 1996, or was it 97? I remember playing the clips on the radio uh, of the CIA inspector general admitting, yes, the CIA shipped in drugs. This is all on record. And Gary Webb, of course, broke it and won the Pulitzer Prize for it, had a new book coming out that was going to doubly prove it, what, five, six years ago. And he had to move. His house was being broken into. He said he was being threatened. He told many people that, including Freya Ricky Ross, who's now out of prison. We had Ricky Ross on from prison to talk about it. Uh, he, uh, From memory, he told Celica Still he was being threatened. He, he told me that. He asked me to get all these documents uh, and, and put it up on a website for him. Uh, it was public stuff. He sent us a desk. My wife kept saying, we got to get this up. But back then, I had almost no internet technical skills. InfoWars was, you know, had a lot of visitors, but we never even got it up. Um, none of it was secret. It was just stuff that he you know, put in public presentations. So I want to say that somebody comes and kills me. I don't know where that disc is. It's where I've dropped the ball so many times. Uh, but um, they, of course, came to his house and shot him twice in the head with a shotgun. Um, now, continuing here, so, so they don't want this information known, but they can't hide it anymore. This information cannot be uh, hidden anymore. And so what's now happening is, and we've shown you the ABC newscast, the CBS newscast, uh, the Fox newscast, where they go, yes, the Army and the Marines in Afghanistan, now 90 plus percent of world opium production, it was around 10 percent before the liberation, boy, they've sure liberated them now, are giving them the fertilizer, giving them security, and helping them uh, pipe in water even to grow more opium. So we can get a lot of people uh, addicted. So the banks can get even more money, and then more stereos and computers and jewelry and cars can be stolen by the addicts uh, so that then they can grab the addicts and put them in prison for 10, 15 years, uh, working for 25 cents an hour in slave labor to drive down wages and displace the country. 
uh, overall economic future. And of course, if you look at the big uh, three or four mega private prisons, they're all subsidiaries of the big six mega banks who openly launder the drug money. So the drug dealers ship the drugs in, use the police to knock out their competition, and then put the users in prison when they're caught using the product they shipped in and use them for slave labor. It's a program where you make money, consolidate power, corrupt police all the way down the line, and it works really well. Now, going back, uh, what, five, six years ago, the interviews are all public. Selica still uh, a high level, well, the highest level DE agent in all of Latin America, former sniper, uh, Vietnam, uh, then later a police officer. Uh, he comes out and says, uh, here's the deal. This is what I've been told by my DEA uh, contacts and my Los Zetas contacts. Their Mexican military trained at Fort Benning, Georgia School of Americas. And they're going to start a war down there as soon as Calderon gets elected. And he said he will be elected. It's going to be staged. And they're going to knock out the three or four cartels that are big that won't pay their money into the United States, just like uh, what's happened with the uh, FARC in Colombia. And, of course, he's one of the main sources for um, the work of Pulitzer Prize winner uh, Gary Webb. Uh, and he wrote the book uh, Powder Burns, now out of print. But the, the point is, is I believed him, but I still was like, man, this is wild. I mean, they're going to have a total collapse in Mexico, and then it's going to be used to start collapsing the Southwest. Well, then, a few, about a year after he said that, the SPP documents got released because Judicial Watch sued and got the North American Union Security Prosperity Partnership documents from the Banff Canada meeting in 2006. They got them in 2007. It's in my film Endgame. And they said, we'll use flu fears, terror fears, and collapsing Mexico to create a continental security perimeter. Well... Earlier this year, Obama publicly created that continental security perimeter in the name of fighting the collapse uh, of what's happening in Mexico and the guns and the drugs and the murder. And Shelley said six years ago that the government was shipping guns in. Before that, the ATF set him up three years ago, he said on this show, and those interviews are all there in the articles, that they were accelerating shipping guns in uh, and that they were going to blame the Second Amendment. And he went and protested and made a big stink about it. And uh, for years, he went to gun shows. I've been at the gun show with him here in Austin. He usually didn't even have guns to sell and sold bumper stickers, T-shirts, his book. And then he needed money because he's a uh, you know, retired uh, DEA school teacher living in a trailer down in South Texas. Uh, and he started selling off his gun collection. And what former cop doesn't have 50 guns? Uh, you know, what the government would call an arsenal. And so he began selling a shotgun, a rifle to, to, to get money. And he he'd even you know, talked about it. You know, a divorced guy, again, he, in his own words, living in a trailer, school teacher, South Texas. Uh, that's what happens to, you know, not saying it's bad to live in a trailer, but the point is he needed money. So, boy, they set him up for selling a couple shotguns legally. A private sale, they said that he was really a gun dealer, and it was all a big setup. And they sent him to prison, and we, you, you the listeners, uh, really tried to help him out with his, uh, with his defense. And so, and I want to thank you for doing that. I know it's a thankless thing when you uh, a lot of times help people, but we do appreciate you. But they still sent him to prison. And so that's what came out of it. So we're on record breaking all of this down. And here we are, top Mexican drug lord. I traffic cocaine for the U.S. government. And that is the report up at Infowars.com, April 27, 2001. And it goes on, the logistical coordinator for the top Mexican drug trafficking gang that was responsible for purchasing the CIA torture jet that crashed with four tons of cocaine on board back in 07 was told, as told the U.S. District Court in the Northern District of Illinois in Chicago that he has been working for the U.S. government um, asset for years. Jesus Vincent Zambala Nabila is the son of El Mayo, uh, Zambadada Garcia, one of the top kingpins of the Sinaloa drug trafficking organization. And it goes on to say that, you know, he released the documents in federal court, kind of like Hal Turner released the documents in federal court, that he really wasn't a white supremacist leader for the last decade attacking yours truly every week, uh, but that he was a national security agent, highest level, top secret for the FBI. And the FBI testified, yes, he is our man. Please don't send him to prison. And the judge said, I don't care. He threatened state judges. He's going to jail. So they certainly, and of course, they went ahead and burned him after hackers got into Hal Turner's computer. Patriots, by the way. 
and did release the fact that he was a federal agent at, uh, above the highest level, uh, a, a, a national security level agent not even known to exist publicly until then in the FBI. It's the same thing with this guy. It doesn't matter if he was running Fort Benning, Georgia trained commandos in Mexico to consolidate the drug trade and, and make sure the prices got jacked up because they don't like prices falling. Doesn't matter. The truth doesn't matter. It will continue. It's like Geraldo Rivera stands there with a Marine Corps colonel and says, you help grow the opium. He says, I sure do. It's for America. You bet. It's for your children. Uh, now, continuing documents. Feds allegedly allowed Sinaloa cartel to move cocaine into U.S. for information. You always love the spin. When they get caught, they're like, well, yeah, well, we've been doing this, so he gave us info on other cartels. Yeah, that you're knocking out. Five years, they admit. U.S. federal agency allegedly allowed the drug trafficking cartel uh, to bring in tons, several tons of cocaine in the United States in exchange for information about rival cartels, according to court documents filed in the U.S. federal court. The allegations are part of the defense of Vicente uh, Zambadal, keep mispronouncing this, Zamba Adal uh, Nabila, who was extradited to the United States to face drug trafficking charges in Chicago. The court in Chicago held a status hearing today and ordered the U.S. government to respond to the motion containing the allegations. And it goes on um, with the documents. And so it breaks it all down. So uh, here you have it. And, and other big drug cartel leaders have come out and said, yes, we were involved in this same group and the government would ship us the guns directly. Of course they did. It's a 500 plus billion dollar a year operation in the U.S. alone. Getting back to the issue of the um, El Paso Times, this has been reported on by Infowars.com. Uh, then a few days later, uh, the New American Magazine did an excellent job uh, breaking it down as well. And finally, Mainstream News has reported on this. And he's entered into the federal record that he was working for the U.S. government and allowed to ship narcotics in. Well, this is exactly what Sully Castell and others told us more than five years ago. And it, it, it's the same reports uh, that we've got uh, now coming out. Um, and, and again, we have uh, those articles up at Infowars.com where top Mexican drug cartel leaders say that they were actually delivered guns by the ATF and other branches of the federal government. And now the head of the ATF has admitted that he had lied uh, when he said he didn't know anything about it and that he was ordered to do so by the Attorney General Eric Holder. Holder then said, no, I didn't order that. And then later documents were released that indeed he did know and that the White House did know. And of course, we played the clips from C-SPAN of the testimony. And it turns out, of course, as I had remembered a year and a half ago, they'd given press conferences admitting that they'd been doing a gun tracing program into Mexico and did know about it. But that was when they were putting their spin on it ahead of time. So by his own admissions, the attorney general has perjured himself to Congress. Now we've learned they've shipped him guns into Florida, California, Illinois, other states to select cartels. And that's what's so scary about this. Uh, is that in most major cities, the police are deployed only to go after, because then they're compartmentalized, small-time people, and then, of course, uh, medium-sized players that aren't paying their cut-in. But more often than not, another drug gang is dispatched to simply murder uh, the other drug dealers, and then the police turn a blind eye. And it's time as a nation to grow up to just how corrupt we become. And this didn't start yesterday. Uh, if you look at prohibition in the 20s, alcohol use more than tripled, government's own numbers, and the profits more than tripled, and all sorts of alcohol poisoning happened. The police became incredibly corrupt. That's how they corrupted the cops. You really couldn't get cops to be part of drug dealing at the time because drugs were sold at drug stores over the counter. It, it wasn't even an issue. Drug use was a lot lower. It was seen as a illness, as a disease. Uh, if you ever dig into old junk piles out in the country, I know I know a lot of folks do it, and I've done it because you can sell the bottles because they're, uh, they're antique, and you know the old medicine bottles, and old Coca-Cola bottles and things. Uh, sometimes the bottles are worth hundreds of dollars a piece. The point is, you dig into old trash piles, and you'll just find anywhere you dig, you'll find them in the middle of nowhere out in the countryside, laudanum bottles. Oh, you got a headache? You got the flu? Drink some of this. It's opium. Coca-Cola had cocaine in it. 
a lot of it in it. That's why it's called Coke. If you don't believe me, just look up the history of Coca-Cola and cocaine. Sometimes I talk about that. People don't believe me because they're ignorant. They're like, Coca-Cola doesn't have cocaine in it. I'm not saying it has it in it now. It's been taken out since the late 1930s. Well, it's been like decoconated. It still has cocaine flavoring. The flavor of Coca-Cola and Pepsi is coca. That's the secret ingredient is uh, decoconated, like decaffeinated cocaine. But uh, here it is, just, just out in the open, not with a bang, but with a whimper. Yeah, it's coming out in court. He's giving them some documents. Uh, they work for the U.S. government and you know, ran this big aircraft operation. And uh, oh, wait, what do we have in Bloomberg from last year? $376 billion in laundered drug money by, the, by Wachovia and Wells Fargo, and nobody got in trouble. But if they catch you with a little bit of cocaine, 10 years minimum sentence in prison.